Welcome to Elevate Family. We are going to start this morning right at the foundation. Uh, we'd like you to stand with us as we sing Cornerstone.
want to welcome you, our family, to our family, and to Elevate, those of you who are here in person and those of you who are watching online. I want to um, bring up the engage question again. What does a growing church need? Now, as a mom, I am constantly trying to figure out what do growing children need? They need food, they need water, they need time together, time alone, all the things. And I think we can probably look at the church the same way. And as we continue to grow as a church and as our children continue to grow, I know for our family, it is a vital, important thing to make church family. And so um, join us in singing this next song, Blessed Be Your Name.
Our scriptures found in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes, just as when it came to you.
Lord, you are great and worthy to be praised. Thank you so much for your Sabbath. Thank you for giving us the ability to come together as a church and worship and praise you. Please bless us now as we go through the service. Be with Pastor Michael as he conveys your message to us. Let us leave this place with you in our hearts. In your name we pray, amen. Kind of at a loss for words. What a moment. How great God is, isn't he? Thank you, praise team, for leading us before the throne of God. I just want to sit here for a moment in, in, in this time and space. Our God is faithful. Our God is great. What an awesome and mighty God we serve. I think we would be remiss if we didn't put a marker in, in this moment, in this time and space. You're here, or you're watching online to remember how great God is. We're going to be talking about that today. That's where we finish up in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm, I'm blown away. I, <laughs> normally I know exactly what I'm going to say, but I'm just, I'm touched. Thank you for, for following the leading of the Spirit in that. Welcome home, where there's always room for one more. It's a good place to start, right? Those of you that uh, are, are long timers here, you know I begin our, our messages with that every week. If this is your first time, glad you're here. Sincerely, welcome home. There's always room for one more. And those of you that are joining online through the, the different views, wherever you're seeing us right now, we're glad you're here too. This summer, we are rethinking church from the books of First and Second Thessalonians. And the question that was asked a moment ago is, what does a growing church need? We're going to think about that question this morning. It was 13 weeks ago that we began this journey through First and Second Thessalonians. May 15 feels like a year ago almost, right? There's a lot that's happened in the past three months. And I've got a, I've got a question for you. Are you, you tired of First and Second Thessalonians yet, for those of you that have been tracking with us? No? <laughs> but here's, here's the, the, the more serious question, right? Like, what else does Paul have to say, like, that he hasn't already said, right? We've got to go back to hear from him again. Well, yes, we do. And chapter 3 of Second Thessalonians is a very interesting chapter that, that Paul, Silas, and Timothy finish their, their, their last words to the people of Thessalonica. We might call them the, Thessalo the Thessalonians. And I love 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 because it's, it's like a, a, a potpourri. You know, like the, the, the vase of good-smelling flower petals and pine cones your grandma has in the toilet in her house? It's kind of like everything comes together and it's just a bunch of different stuff, but it, it smells good. It's got one focus. Or maybe it's like a, a, a charcuterie board or a smorgasbord, which are both just as fun to eat as they are to say, Right? But there's, just, there's a lot going on in this chapter, but there's one single phrase that brings it all together. Let me spoil it for you. We give you the, the spoiler at the beginning so you can be like, all right, we have church, we're good, we can walk out. I know if you head out right now exactly where you're leaving. The one phrase, the one thing that brings the whole potpourri together, the, the smorgasbord, is that God is faithful. And Paul, Silas, and Timothy will go on in this chapter to unpack for us three ways in which God is faithful. And I would offer you today that what a growing church needs is a faithful God. A God who is faithful in love, in peace, and in grace. So that's the sermon. Praise him, come back up, and we're going to go. No, we've got to unpack it a little bit more, right? We've got to get into Scripture. So if you've got your Bibles with me, with you today, uh, on your device, or whether you've brought the, the paper version, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we're going to look at right now. I've got the New Living Translation up on the screen that I'm going to be reading from. Whatever version you have in front of you is just fine. Uh, people will ask me, like, hey, what version do you recommend? I recommend the one that you will read regularly. 
And then once you get into that, we can talk nuances later. But the one you read regularly, that's the important one. So whatever you got, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 says this. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes, just as when it came to you. Pray, too, that we will be rescued from wicked and evil people, for not everyone is a believer. Paul, Silas, and Timothy bring this request to the Thessalonians. They say, please pray for us. And here's the specific prayer that we need Pray. We want the word of God to spread. Paul's got a singular focus here, and that's on mission. Notice Paul does not say we need the church to grow. Paul says we need the word to spread. And there's an assumption that he makes that as the word of God is spread throughout the land and as people encounter God through his word, the church will grow. The word of God is powerful. The word of God produces church community. We don't gather because we are a church. We gather because of the word of God. And by that simple nature, we become the church. We become the community. The word of God informs the way that we commune together. And if it doesn't, we're doing it wrong. Because this is, this is the guide. This is the, the path, the, the, the way that we should go. God lays it out how we should interact with him and with others. And the word of God is what drives us to commune together. And second, Paul's request to say, hey, pray for, for rescue from the evil people or from the evil ones. We spent a lot of time this summer looking at how the Thessalonian church was persecuted and how Paul, Silas, and Timothy got run out of the town because of the word that they were preaching. And Paul says, God wants to intervene on our behalf. And if we pray for rescue, rescue will come because God is faithful. I don't know if you saw this week in the news, but there, anybody been watching the Olympics? A few of you, it's okay to admit, it's all right, you know. Team USA, right, we've been doing pretty well. But have you seen the pictures of the, the Olympians coming together and how there's different countries that are celebrating each other's victories in the, the swimming pool and the and track and field, and they're all just super excited? I saw a, a cluster of pictures this week, and I'm like, that, that's a picture of heaven. But I don't know if you heard, there, there's a guy that's been standing outside of the Olympic village, and he's been holding up a sign and he's been going there every day and, and holding up the sign as the, the Olympians are leaving their residence. And the sign says something to the effect of, whether you win or lose, we're proud of you because you are Olympians. You are awesome people. It doesn't matter what the outcomes are. You've made it here. And imagine in, in my mind's eye as maybe Paul is approaching the church in Thessalonica. He's the guy outside the village holding up a sign that says, God is faithful and I want you to know that 100%. Win or lose, whether you come in first place or last place, God is faithful. That's how he breaks it down. Verse 3 of chapter 3 in 2 Thessalonians. Puts it this way. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. Paul says, pray to this God because he's faithful. Those, the evil people that are out there, God will provide strength so that he will guard you and will guard me from the evil that has, that has to come. And by the way, Paul's got a lot of confidence, verse 4 as well. And we are confident in the Lord, this faithful Lord, this faithful God that Paul is talking about, that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command you. And here he's referencing the, the rest of the letters. He's, he's given them a lot of commands. And there's, there's a power pack of, of what Paul, Silas, and Timothy are encouraging the Thessalonians to do. And he doesn't say, we're confident in you that by your own means you will be able to accomplish all of this. He says, no, 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 no. We are confident in the faithful Lord, the God who is faithful, that you are doing and will continue to do the things we commanded you. Paul says, I'm putting my, my hope in Jesus. And he's going to accomplish his good purpose and good will in this. And we come to the, the first 
aspect of the faithfulness of God in verse 5 of chapter 3. May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding and expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. Paul will share two other wishes like this, blessings upon the people finishing up this chapter, but we pause for a moment in verse 5 to see the faithfulness of God in his love. God is faithful in love. He says, by the way, you're not alone in in trying to to figure out this, this world and how you're living and what we've commanded you to do. You are not alone because God is faithful and he's leading your hearts into a full understanding and expression of the love of God. He says, may that love of God have a robust indwelling and a deep outworking in your life. By the way, may you have the the patient endurance of Jesus, because we could all use a little patience, right? I know I can. What does a growing church need? A growing church needs a God who is faithful in love. Maybe you're wondering this morning, like, how do I love others? What do I, what do, I do to, to reach out to those around me that may be different to me or the same to me? Or I struggle with the tangible way that I can, I can love the people around me. Or maybe you're the one that's, that's feeling alone. Maybe you just need a friend, somebody to, to walk by your side. Paul blesses the Thessalonians, and I think he shares this blessing for us that God is willing to lead our hearts into a full understanding of his love. Sometimes he'll throw us off into the deep end, right? You've been there, right? Where God just like leads you to some place and it's like, well, here you go. Other times it's a constant, patient, working, step by step. But God promises that he's faithful, that we'll come to a full understanding of his love. And when we come to a full understanding of his love, the cool thing about God is that there's more to know. And that we will constantly be coming to a full understanding of who God is and the love that he has for us. And that knowledge of the love of God compels us to express that to others. And if the love of God isn't compelling us to do that, then perhaps we don't have the love of God in our hearts. What does a growing church need? A God who is faithful in love. Paul continues on. There's a group of people that he mentioned in the last letter that are kind of these idle livers, these people that are just kind of, kind of living on everybody else's hard work. They're not doing a whole bunch to bring it. And he, he brings these people up again because he's, he's got a little bit of a bone to pick with them. Verse 6, now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away from all believers who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition they received from us. Ouch, right? We talk a lot around here about, hey, welcome home. There's always room for one more. This idea of inclusion and a safe space and everything. And Paul says, hold on. There are some people that are in your midst that you, you stay away from them because they'll lead you down the wrong path. There's this group that's just kind of idly living their lives. They're not really staying true to the traditions that we've taught you about. And you have to be careful with them. Verses 7 through 10, we're not going to take time to read through them this morning, but Paul will say, hey, live our example. Remember when we were with you, we didn't ask you for money. We were out working hard so that we could feed ourselves so that there wasn't this idea of a transactional gospel happening. Because the gospel is not about transaction, it's about transformation. The gospel cannot be bought or sold, and when you do it the wrong way, and you you mooch off of other people, and you try to sell the goodness of God and the gospel of God and receive means uh, from others in exchange, then you have cheapened what God has to offer. Because all of a sudden there's something in it for you if somebody will accept the gospel of God. He says, work hard to earn your keep. Don't mooch off of others. And then he gets, he gets to the core. This is like the, the, the power punch in verses 11 through 15. He puts it this way. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. None of us meddle in other people's business, right? We don't do that. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. 
take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. Stay away from them so that they will be ashamed. Ouch. But don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or a sister. In the words of the modern philosopher and poet Taylor Swift, haters going to hate, 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 hate. Just shake it off. Just, just let them go. Shake it off. But here's the thing. There's, there's a group of people in the Thessalonian church that they're not pulling their own weight. And maybe sometimes they're the loudest complainers because they're like, man, children's Sabbath school just it, it ain't cutting it for me. Like those elevate people too, like with the lights and everything else. Like what's going on? Like I just, I don't get, you know, they, they complain sometimes. I want to encourage you that maybe if you're, you're tempted in a way to, to just kind of be a passer through, I encourage you to invest in this community. If you see a need, step up and, and, and do something. We are the body of Christ, and we need each other. And if you've got a complaint or something, like, let's talk about it, but let's just not leave it there. Let's not live idle lives and, and mooch off the system without pouring into it so that other people will be blessed. Because that's what the gospel of Jesus is all about, dating back all the way to Abraham. God tells Abraham, I will bless you in order to bless others. And in the same way, the call comes out from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. That we must not grow tired of doing good and stepping and step up to the call. So I invite you to, to be a part of, of what's going on here. If you're wondering all the things that go into it, I mean, you've got music and, and lights and, and sound, and there's a whole team of people up in that room up there that are helping you online, making sure you can connect. There's children's Sabbath schools. We've got service projects. We have food bank every month. I, if you want to be involved, come and talk to me or anybody else that you've seen on the stage today. We want you to be a part of this community and invest in it. And no shame if you're not there yet. We're glad you're here and a part of what's going on. And here's the second blessing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself, remember this is the faithful Lord, the Lord that Paul has mentioned in, in, in verse 5, he says, the faithful Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. And think about a moment, the contrasting pictures that between verses 11, 15 and, and verse 16. Paul, Silas, and Timothy call out the busybodies, the, the ones that are just kind of going around and, and doing, doing a whole bunch of stuff, but there's not much to see after they've done it. They're living idle lives, mooching off the system. And Paul says, may the faithful Lord of peace. In Hebrew, it would be the Lord of Shabbat the Lord of Sabbath, the Lord of Shalom himself, give you his peace at all times and in every situation. And this peace is not necessarily just a cessation of activity, but it's a, a space and a place where we realize that we don't have to work for what we're trying to earn in salvation. That we can go through this life no matter what news feed scrolls across our phone or our TV no matter what happens in this community or abroad in our country or in our state, that we can navigate life with peace. And someone can look at us and be like, wow, the entire world is burning down, and that person seems peaceful about it. What's, what's going on? This faithful God of peace, Paul says, may he give you his peace at all times and in every situation. And this is another one of those moments where, you, you know, you can look up all in Greek and every in Greek as well. Let me, let me this gets really deep. All means all, like ev everything, all of it, right? So in all times and in every situation, when you leave from this place, you can access the peace of God. When you're here in this space, you can access the peace of God. Driving to work and someone cuts you off, you can access the peace of God, and like, Lord knows, some of us need it, right? Like, some of us need a little bit of peace in our lives. God says, it's right here. I want to be with you. And here's the thing. 
the Lord be with you all. The language shifts that it's not just peace, but it's God being with us in the sense that the peace of God maybe is God himself. And that his presence might be the thing that we need. Oftentimes we're looking for those blessings. Like we're running around like, God, would you bless this? Would you bless that? Please bless my food and the, the adventures that I'm going on today. And God says, I simply want to be with you. Heather Thompson Day in her book, It's Not Your Turn, recently came out, fantastic book. I encourage you to get it if you haven't read it. Here's what she says. The best part of God is not whether or not he blesses me. It's God. It's knowing that feast or famine, we get to set the table for two, me and God. Rather than the blessings being determined by God's presence, I now believe God's presence is the blessing. What more could we ask for, right? To simply be in the presence of God. And let me, let me tell you a moment of disclosure for myself. I, I struggle with this. Type A personality, like I'm a go-getter, like let's go, let's do it. We're about to start the school year at Southwestern. Uh, our, our elementary school and high school are starting up. It's like, it's go time. August, here we go into the school year. God says, come and be in my presence. This summer, Melissa and I a couple times got to take a few vacations, travel around the country a little bit. And we would sometimes get to where we were going and, uh, and we would uh, unpack, unload, do whatever. And I'm like, okay, what are we going to do? And she's like, we're on vacation. Like, what do we need to do? We need to, like, rest and calm down. And I appreciate that so much because I'm the first to be like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And she's like, what's the hurry? Simply being here with you is why we came. And I think God, in some ways, says the same thing for us. Why are you busy running from this place to that, doing this and doing this, and trying to be God in other people's lives and in other situations, instead of simply resting and being in my presence. So I encourage you today, if you haven't already, to find some time to simply sit in God's presence. Set your phone aside. You can turn it off so it's like not even a distraction. It might be in your back patio. It might be in your closet, in your bed, in your living room, state park somewhere close by. But to simply sit and be still in God's presence and let him come close to you because his peace that he gives us surpasses all understanding. Philippians tells us that. And then somehow we're able to navigate our lives no matter what's going on. Bills to be paid, relationships that are broken, stuff that needs to be fixed, we can navigate it with peace because God is faithful in his peace. What does a growing church need? What does a growing church need? Let's use the right words here. It needs a God who is faithful in love and a God who is faithful in peace. And finally, this letter from Paul gets personal. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting. Paul takes the pen from his scribe and he begins to scrawl a personal message to 2 Thessalonians. He says, I do this in all my letters to prove they are from me. And we can imagine for a moment that there's maybe a distinguishing mark or maybe he's signing his name or initialing something, but perhaps there's something deeper going on here. John Stott in his commentary on First and Second Thessalonians puts it this way on page 198. Paul takes the pen from his scribe and writes his final grace wish with his own hand. He probably closed every letter in his own hand, even without expressly saying so. So think back to that moment. Paul is finishing up his second and perhaps final letter to the Thessalonian church, to this, this growing church, and he pauses for a moment. 
This letter, in a lot of ways, would become a template for the rest of the letters that he would write. And maybe he knew it then, or maybe he didn't, but he probably paused for a moment as he's dictating this letter to the scribe and says, hold on, I've got to write these last words myself, because one, I want the church to know that this letter is from me, and that there's no other letter in circulation that if it doesn't have my handwriting on it, then it's not for me, and I want people to know that. But I think his final statement in this book becomes very personal to Paul. He's got the pen in his hand. He's got the papyrus out in front of him. And he he pauses to reflect. What does this growing church need? And he pens these words in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 18. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you you all. It's his, it's his final words. So what, is, what, is, what are the last thing that, that these people need to hear? These final words are important because they will become the theme of Paul's ministry as he navigates incredible persecution, as he's dumped in burning oil and he's, he's shipwrecked and he's lashed and he's flogged and he says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you you all, because that's what it's all about, is the grace of a God who is faithful, not only in love, not only in peace, but in grace. So imagine Paul is, as he's reflecting. Paul, the, the kid who held the coats at the stoning of Stephen, instilling inside of him a hatred for the Christian church and the Christian people. Paul, the religious leader who would hunt down those early Jesus followers, killing them in the name of the church, trying to to squash out a rebellion and bring back the church to fundamentalism, killing people in the name of God. And that same Paul, that guy who the Lord Jesus Christ got a hold of on the road to Damascus, and extended grace to him. He says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that has extended grace to me, the one that's turned my life around, the one that has called me out of the miry pit and set me on a firm foundation, may that same grace that I've felt, that's transformed my life, may that grace be extended to y'all. If it's the Texas version, that's what he's saying, right? So what does a growing church need? need? A growing church needs a God who is faithful in grace. That's the God we serve. We serve a faithful God who is faithful beyond our wildest imaginations. I was talking with someone last night and they were explaining to me that the, the singular thing for them that's been transformational is the faithfulness of God and it blows them away time after time. The more that they've come to understand who God is, how God, the omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, the guy who's keeping everything in order remains faithful to us even when we are unfaithful. I offer you to you today that the God that we serve is faithful, full stop. Whatever is going on in your life, whatever difficulties you may be facing or feel that you're facing, let's be honest, some things are self-imposed, right? No shame, happens to all of us. God is faithful. No matter what's happened before, no matter what is to come, God is faithful. And if the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the peace of a faithful God and the love of God can transform a guy like Paul, turn him from being a Jesus hater and a Jesus and a Jesus follower hater. Eh, it doesn't really work out, but you get what I mean. If we can transform a guy like him, the same God can transform us. Because God is faithful in love, in peace. And in grace. And what I believe this community needs is that God, that God who is faithful no matter what. He's the God that's been walking with us since the beginning of this church in the late 1800s. 
in the beginning of what we call Elevate in the early 2010s. God is faithful. He hasn't left us yet, and he never will. I don't really have a, an appeal for you this morning, like an action item, like, hey, here's what you need to do. But what I encourage you is to bask in the presence of a faithful God today. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Thank you that you're faithful in love, in peace, and in grace. A God like you that would look towards us and extend grace, it's beyond my wildest imaginations. But God, thank you for the letters to the church in Thessalonica. That you inspired a guy by the name of Paul, another guy by the name of Silas, another guy by the name of Timothy, to write these letters to that church and little did they know they would be a blessing for us today. God, thank you for journeying with us in this 13-week look at these letters. And God, may we bask in your faithfulness today. Your faithful love, your faithful peace, and your faithful grace. God, come sit on the throne of our hearts tired of trying and trying to be you instead of just letting you be you. Because when you're you and we're us, that's what makes sense. So God, so God, today we leave our lives in your hands and we so look forward to when you come back. I thank you for being faithful to us as individuals and to us as a community. And may we share that with those around us. In Jesus' name I pray.
has a couple of people that we want to recognize this morning who have been uh, helping us out over the past year. Alethea and Zandri, would you both come up here? Uh, Alethea and Zandri have been our worship coordinators for the past year. And uh, both of them are kind of going through some transitions this summer. Alethea is heading up to uh, a college that will remain nameless, that is somewhere north of here. Uh, and uh, Zandri uh, is transitioning, uh, still going to be a part of our team, um, but is stepping back a little bit from the, the worship coordination. So would you give it up for them? They've been, they've been the ones that uh, week in and week out over the past year uh, have just, they're the ones that, that schedule our praise teams, that help with song selection, that make sure the, the, the backgrounds and the, the lighting work together, that what we experience each week as a community in worship um, is something that's a blessing for you. And so we want to thank them so much for their hard work um, over the past year. Uh, we got a couple gifts for you. So Jonathan, you can bring those up. Yeah, we can't let you go without uh, giving you a little bit something. Some flowers. Of course, flowers are always nice. And uh, I asked you both what your favorite books of the Bible were, and we have a special print of Romans for Zandri and a special print of Psalms for Aletheia. So let's give it up for them one more time. And last thing I'd like to do, I'd like to pray over you both in your transitions and everything. And if you would like to extend your hand and blessing to them, I won't ask you to, to stand right now, but you can just extend a hand out to them uh, in a symbol of blessing over them uh, as they transition uh, at the end of the summer. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much uh, for this morning, and uh, we're, we're thankful that you, you're faithful, you're the God of peace, and it's well with our souls. And it's today that we acknowledge and thank you for working through Aletheia and Zandri over this past year. It's been an incredible, incredible blessing to see what they've brought to this community, and uh, we, uh, we pray, God, that you will go with Aletheia as she uh, moves and, and heads somewhere north. And uh, for Zandri and what she's got going on and uh, her continued help here in this community, God, be with them, go with them. May your peace reign in their lives and may they have a full knowledge and understanding and experience of you as a faithful God. So God, we leave them in your hands. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you both so much. As we sing our final song this morning, we'll have a QR code up on the screen. If you'd like to give through Venmo, you can scan that, um, or you can head on over to AdventsGiving.org and put in Keen Church and elevate all the details there. Or if you have a physical offering, you know, some cash or a check that you brought this morning, we've got boxes in the back, black boxes here and in the back that you can give um, your gifts there. As we sing our final song, I invite you to stand uh, and embrace this moment as we worship the faithful God, the God of love, the God of peace, and the God of grace. May you bask in that today as we close out. And as you're standing, uh, if you've ever spent any time around our families, you'll hear harmonies all the time, sometimes even when we don't want to. But um, that's something that we wanted to share with you today. So we're going to go through this song, Better Is One Day, and we're going to sing some parts and we would love it if you would join us. So for anybody who knows you're a soprano, we're going to start with the soprano part. Okay, here we go. to a part. is 
us as we say the blessing. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it.